Welcome everyone to Polycarp's Paradigm. My name is Eric Robinson. I have a very special guest with us today, Trent Horn, staff apologist for Catholic Answers, author of nine books, including Can a Catholic Be Socialist and Why We're Catholic, among many others. And Trent, you have three master's degrees in theology, philosophy, and bioethics. Yes. I'm so happy that you came on the on the show today. Uh, Thank you. And introduce yourself, please, if, if I missed anything here. No, you've, you've basically got it. I'm a Catholic apologist and I work for Catholic Answers. Our mission is to explain and defend uh, the truth of the Catholic faith. And I'm happy to do that in my books, in my di- public dialogues and debates, on my podcast, The Council of Trent. Uh, so that's always a lot of fun. Uh, you've caught me in an interesting time uh, as we're recording now. This is, I'm in the middle of the Texas blizzard. So we've had frozen pipes, rolling blackouts. Uh, we're under a boil water notice, so you're not supposed to, you can't drink the water, so we're using our bottle. I have copious bottled water and prep work because I'm a big prepper. But even still, uh, I'm a little, a little unshorn and a <laughs> little worse for the wear of being up with the kids and everything, but uh, just so people can see, I'm, although I guess because I work from home, I just get more and more uh, disheveled when you work at home. But yeah, wow. no, it's good, and um, I'm super excited to be here. Yes, that's awesome. You probably thought moving from California would make your life easier, but uh, Texas just... its You know, it still is. People in Texas are different. They're just really friendly. Yes. And like, I, I feel like we've been able to see a lot more community here than even when we were back in California. Uh, there's great communities in California, but it's just a different feel. And, and we, we like yes. it. And I, I mean, I took the kids sledding the other day and it's fun. You know, you, you make the best of it. Yeah. I was born and raised in Texas and I... I can attest that the people there are very friendly, very awesome, and my whole family still lives there. And so, yeah. um, well, welcome to Texas then, oh, uh, yeah. even though I'm in Colorado now, but welcome. Sure. Um, sure, sure. Cool. Well, you are also, like me, a Catholic convert, and I actually don't know, I've actually been following your podcast, and I, I really enjoy it, and I've kept up to date on some of the debates you've had. I've actually taken a class from you because you're also an adjunct professor at Holy Apostles College and Seminary That's right. uh, on moral apologetics. And, um, and so, but I actually am not as familiar with your own story. And so I just wanted to bring you on to share your story because I think that's so powerful, uh, especially for our listeners who may not be Catholic yet, um, right. you know, to, to share your story. And so let's start from the beginning. How did you grow up religiously? Like what was your background like? And what were some of the spiritual influences that guided you? Yeah, I grew up in kind of a non-religious household. My dad is Jewish, but, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't like wear a yarmulke and go to temple every week or anything like that. Uh, He was more of what you call like a reformed Jew. You know, he's Jewish because that's his ethnicity. And so I shared that ethnicity and and, I'm appreciative and sympathetic of that. Uh, but so he was Jewish. My mom used to be Catholic and she's more of like a non-denominational Christian now, but growing up, we didn't go to church. So we were a very unchurched household. We watched like the Hanna-Barbera Bible cartoons. And I still show those to my kids, by the way, they are stupendous. Uh, look, look, yeah, the Hanna-Barbera, the people who made the, the Flintstones and the Jetsons did the greatest story, greatest stories from the Bible. And they're awesome. They have great voice talent. Uh, Ed, like the, the, the voices they get, like they get Ed Asner, the old guy from up, he plays Joshua. And so it's just, it's just great. Children of Israel. It's just, it's, it's, it's great. And then the shows don't pander to kids. Like the opening of the show on Noah, it shows like people getting beaten to death and they're like, like their money's being stolen and women dancing in provocative clothes, nothing like immodest, but it's to show like the story of Noah Unlike like a VeggieTales thing or something, it's not like, oh no, the rain's coming. It's like the earth was wicked and vile and God chose to cleanse it. And it's like, oh, now you see why he did the flood. Wow. You know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't treat kids. I just don't believe, I like, inter, I like media that doesn't treat kids like idiots. Yes. And so I, I, a lot of modern media, even some Catholic media for kids kind of treats them like idiots and they're not. They can handle mature themes. Even if they don't understand it, they will later when they get older. So. Yeah. So that was a bit of a discursus there. But uh, no, they showed me that, but we didn't go to church. My mom took me, I think, once to a count. No, oh, it, that's fine. You can, I cannot because I have an interview right now. I love you. I love you. This is have a perfect. Good one. Speaking of Hanna-Barbera. Hi, mister. <laughs> Matthew King. I also have three children. 
Yes. I have yes. Matthew, who is the oldest that just came in here. I have Thomas and my middle kid and Mr. John Paul, who's a little baby. Wow. And um, Matthew is just asking if uh, I could go hold the baby and help out. Um, I probably should have made more clear to my wife. I would be on an, an interview uh, right now. So, uh, but hey, this is what it's like having a family. That honestly, my my best accomplishment accomplishment. My number one thing I'm happy about is becoming Catholic, and uh, the number two thing would be being married and being blessed with children. So I'm yes. going to shut the door. We will see if they come back. That door unfortunately does not have a lock on it. Yes. This is this is just my 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 office has a lock, but my office is um, right now in this this blizzard. It's like 50 degrees in there. I'm actually, yes. I was actually, I took my gear out of it because I was worried about the gear getting messed up. Even it was dropping yeah. into the 40s even. And I was like, yeah, I actually had to tape the door to keep the cold air out of the rest of the house um, wow. when we were losing power. So I have kiddos, uh, how I was raised, very different from my children. My children yes. go to mass, I mean, divine liturgy every week. I guess we, we, we will get to the story. I'm sorry for the, the Yes, no. Trails. This is great. But that's fine. So for, for me, actually, another thing about my faith, some people, uh, more people know about it now because I guess I obnoxiously talk about it a lot. But I've been attending a Byzantine Catholic church for about two years now, and okay. I absolutely, I absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. For those who don't know, yes. the Catholic Church should really be called the Catholic Churches. There are, I want to say, there are twenty-four autonomous churches with their different rites and liturgies, but they all are in union with the Pope. Uh, so they're all Catholic, part of the one universal church. And the, the largest one, when people say Catholic, they usually mean the Latin, the Western church, the Latin rite, uh, which uh, has either the, the Tridentine Mass, a.k.a. the Latin Mass, or the, the, the new Mass, the Novus Ordo Mass, which is the more common one that people go to. But there's all other kinds of churches. There's Syro Malabar, which is the Mass of the church in India. Uh, there is uh, the Chaldean Catholics who are in Iraq. Um, Maronite, very common in like Lebanon and Syria. Mm -hmm. I've been to a lot of these services. Uh, Byzantine, that liturgy comes from Constantinople. It's about 1,500 years old. It's the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, St. Basil the Great. It is very similar to Eastern Orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. Actually, if you went to our Byzantine church, we're Ruthenian Byzantine. If you went to this and then went, and I have a relative who is Eastern Orthodox. It's very similar. Yeah. Uh, the only thing different you would notice is there's a picture of the Pope in the vestibule. I but absolutely love the Byzantine rite. I actually really? went for the first time last year to one. I, I'm not part of one right now, um, but last year I went to one for the first time. And one of the profound moments for me was at the very end of the liturgy, the priest held up the crucifix to everyone and everyone kissed the crucifix. Yes. And he said, Christ is among us. Christ is among us. Christ is among right. us. And that's how we left. And I was like, whoa, that was so cool. Oh, there's so much. The, what I love about Byzantine, the Byzantine liturgy, is the divine liturgy. Is it's actually, it's sung basically from beginning to end. Like yes. we, we, we sing almost, there's hardly any silence. Some people tell me, I don't like it. I, I want silence to pray. And I get that. But at the same time, if I want silence, I can wait till the kids go to bed and I can make silence at home. Right. I can't make a communal sung liturgy at home. And so mm-hmm. that's, what I, that's what I appreciate about being a part of that. Uh, and it's all very direct. The hymns, you know, it's, it's always the same classic hymns and the, the music is wonderful. Yes, and yes. it's just, a, it's a wonderful tradition. And my kids feel like, and it's child-friendly. At our, at our parish here in uh, Dallas, uh, there are probably like 30 families. Uh, half, the, half the attendees are probably under the age of 10. Wow. There's which so many is, kids. Which parish is that? I'm just St. Basil the Great in Irving. Okay. Wow. I'll also check that out when I go. You should. Go back. Anyone listening should come by and, and see. It's um it's really a treat. So like my, my kids, you know, they'll go to Divine Liturgy every week. I went to church maybe once with my mom. She took me to a counter the culture um thing. Like uh I think she just didn't want me to do drugs. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but otherwise, I was I believed in a God that was out there. Okay. But I, I didn't believe in um Jesus. I thought Christianity was just a myth. So I, I didn't believe in, um, wow. in any of that. So now did you uh, get into trouble or were you kind of a morally upright wanting to be studious type of person or so? Like, I was a good, I was a good kid. You're a good kid. I have a younger brother and a younger sister and I'm the oldest. 
So I feel like the oldest always feels like they're the third parent. Yeah. And so they need to, um, you know, they, they, they have to, uh, keep an eye on everybody and try yeah. to keep order. And so I, that was kind of my, my shtick. I tried to do, do well in school, wanted to be smart, wanted to be successful. Uh, and so that's what I, what I did, even though I still had a hard time relating to people in middle school and high school and things like that. Uh, so it was a little bit of a loner type. Uh, but then the, things really started to change though in high school, especially when I met Catholics who befriended me and inter- introduced me to Catholicism. I was going to ask, so yeah, what was kind of the first chink in the armor? What's kind of the first thing that led you down the road to Catholicism? Well, I was just in my English teacher's class getting a paper graded and the Catholic youth group that met there every Thursday came in for a pizza lunch. So I decided to stick around for pizza. My friends were there. Other people were there I didn't know about. I didn't know who they were. They were college students. And I liked the discussions they had. So I, I came back to the, the pizza lunch every so often and they had these discussions about God and religion. And I thought, oh, this is kind of cool. This is interesting. And, you know, came and did that. And then they invited me to an outing, a Sunday night outing. Uh, they went to In-N-Out. It was, this was In-N-Out Burger in Arizona, Phoenix. This was like the very first time we got In-N-Out. So this was probably in like 2001, wow. 2002. So it was a huge deal. So we went on the bus, went and did that. And I liked these people seemed authentic and smart. And I wanted to learn more. I wanted to hang out with them. I wasn't totally sold. And it got me hooked on what going online and going to atheist websites and Christian websites and looking at the arguments. And I saw a lot of my arguments against Christianity before were against things like young earth creationism. Like I thought I couldn't be Christian if uh, I had to believe the earth was 6,000 years old, you know, and evolution was false. Cause I, I like science. I was in the young astronomers club. Uh, I, I, I really enjoyed science. I still enjoy science. And mm-hmm. if I had to get rid of science to be Christian, I was just not going to become Christian. And then I saw, no, there's, there's no contradiction here. So uh, I, I investigated and saw, no, I, I don't have to be, believe in Jesus. I don't have to believe in that. Mm-hmm. And the Catholic Church doesn't require you to believe in that. It allows you, but it doesn't require you. So I, I went and I looked up Christian and atheist debates. I looked up debates between a Protestant apologist, William Lane Craig, against atheists. Mm-hmm. I was impressed. And I looked at the arguments. Uh, this is back before YouTube, though. So I had to find MP3s wow. of the debates to listen to. This is, I think YouTube came about in 2005, mm-hmm. around that time. Um, but yeah, no, that was, um, that was, that was when I, I started down the journey. And, and the end of my journey, I came to the conclusion that not only did God exist, but he revealed himself in the person of Christ. So I knew I wanted to become a Christian, but then I had to try to figure out, you know, well, well what kind of Christian should I be? That was, the, that was the next step. And was this in high school, you say, or in college? High school still. Uh, okay. sophomore year, I, I became Christian. It was then junior year. Yeah, it was junior year. It was 2002, spring of 2002 that I became Catholic. Uh, and so I started my investigation there and I remember going to borders, the old book, the bookstore mm-hmm. and I got Carl Keating's book, Catholicism and fundamentalism, like my, one of my very first apologetics books. And I read through that and started to read through other, uh, books for and against Catholicism. And it made sense to me that I, I said, look, I wanted to be like the first Christians. Well, at first I said, I'm just going to do what the Bible says. But then when I looked at the Bible, I realized, well, wait a minute. The Bible never says that's what I should do. The Bible never says, just read this document and you'll know what to do. It doesn't say that. Yeah. So then I said, all right, uh, I will become, I want to be like the first Christians. So I read the church fathers, the excerpts of them and saw, mm-hmm. wow, they're, they're not like the Protestants I know today. They act way more like Catholics when they talk about the Eucharist. Uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch is a huge, huge witness yes. to Catholicism, I think, honestly. I think any Protestant who wants to learn about the Catholic faith or really consider, if, if they want to be like the first Christians, I, think, I really think they should read the letters of St. Ignatius of Antioch. Because mm-hmm. what's fascinating there is you, you, what you see is you don't see a reliance on Scripture you don't see a reliance on, oh, the Bible is our authority. There's no such concept. At best, at this time, you had some of, of the letters, Paul's letters circulating in the church. Some of the, Justin Martyr refers to the Gospels as the memoirs of the apostles. But there's no idea of a closed canon of scripture apart from right. it. Rather, the sense of authority, Ignatius says, look, the church is composed of the bishop, the priest, and the deacon. He says, if you don't have bishops, priests, and deacons, you're not a church. And your bishops have to come from the line of bishops that go back to the apostles. So look to the church where 
the bishop is, there is the Catholic Church. And Ignatius of Antioch was the first person who referred to the Christian Church as the Catholic Church. Seeing what he said about the Eucharist, uh, church governance, yes. it all it all was really coming together. Me and the, the, seeing these other church fathers, yeah. So then I, I still had objections, other things that were concerning, but I worked through those, went through the RCA process uh, in September of my junior year of high school. And then in spring of my junior year, I was baptized, confirmed, and received into the Catholic faith. And I'm, I'm forever uh, grateful to the people who just reached out to me and just invited me. They just invited me. That's all that, that was yeah. needed. And then I was able to go on the journey. They didn't have to, they answered some of my questions, but they didn't have to know everything. They just had to invite me. That's all they had to do. And it yeah. just paid off. Come and see. It's funny right. how uh, much food uh, influenced your journey. The Lord knows, knows us. And so pizza and then in and out In and out Well, I'm yeah. a 16. Uh, I'll be honest with you. What is 16 year old boys interested in? Food and girls, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I liked food and I liked talking to these nice people. Who yes. Were there. And it was a girl that invited me to church. Everyone always is funny. They're always like, then did you get married? I'm like, no, we didn't get married. Yeah. No, that's, no, that is not what happened. I, I actually didn't get married to my wife. Uh, I married my wife 12 years after that. It took me 12 years before Laura and I got married. Wow. But um, I'm so grateful to all those, all those people. And it just starts with that. And, you know, I, I, as a teenager, you want to have an authentic sense of identity. And I, I just encourage other teenagers to not follow the crowd. It's funny to be countercultural today is to be Catholic. The, mm. You know, the, the hip thing to do in, for, is to hold these disordered views in our culture today. The countercultural thing, the rebellious thing is actually to be Catholic. Yeah. Yeah. So going back real quick, uh, riddle me this, Trent. Mm -hmm. um, how did you get from God in general to Jesus specifically? Sure. Well, I looked at the person of Jesus and I was really focused on the resurrection. You know, what's okay. funny is actually in a few weeks, uh, I'm going to be debating Matt Dillahunty on the resurrection. Okay. So Matt is a pretty well-known online atheist. And uh, I mean, he started after my conversion. I think he started like 10 years ago. Uh, doing doing his stuff with um, the atheist experience is his show. Uh, so we'll be debating the resurrection actually in a few weeks. And I, I was just surprised by the evidence for the resurrection that I always thought that Christianity was a legend built on legends, uh, just like other religions, but other religions have legendary material mm -hmm. or they're based on things that there's not really good evidence. They're miraculous at the start. Uh, like Muhammad even if, you know, Muhammad says that the angel Gabriel gave him the Quran, well, there's nothing in the Quran that is miraculous. It's, it reads like medieval Arabic poetry. Uh, Muslims, the only argument Muslims give for Islam is that nobody could write anything like the Quran. It's like, well, no, that's not true. We, we can do that. People have done that. And even if something is really unique in style, it doesn't mean it's divine. There's no, there's no literary, nobody can write like Shakespeare doesn't mean that Shakespeare is divinely inspired. Right. So it's not a good argument. I'm not, I wasn't impressed by it. Buddha didn't perform miracles. Hinduism is based on super duper old legends. Uh, looking at all this stuff, uh, you know, Mormonism say, well, Joseph, even if Joseph Smith had golden plates and he wrote down this story, that doesn't prove that any of this happened. He could have had an artifact and he just told a good story. In fact, the story about Native Americans coming to America Jews coming to America and being the ancestors of Native Americans, that was actually a book that, that was the plot of a book written five years before the Book of Mormon was published. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's called A View of the Hebrews. So it's <laughs> like, oh, I'm not entirely convinced this is supernatural. So I mean, but the resurrection belief, when I saw everything there saying, look, what are the facts? Jesus died. His followers proclaimed him to be alive. They could have checked his empty tomb. Uh, they, uh, for all, they were down and out. If this was a normal messianic movement, they would have withered away or elevated James uh, or someone close to Jesus in his place. Or if they had hallucinated, they would have thought that Jesus was in heaven, not that his body had gloriously resurrected. Uh, I mean, I remember once I, I thought that I had a grief. I, I had a dream where I talked to a dead friend and it seemed real. You know, she's and I wake up and she's not there. But these are visions. You know, these are appearances during the day, mm -hmm. you know, with groups of people. Groups don't hallucinate the same thing. And if I saw my dead friend during the day, I would go and see if her tomb is, or her casket is empty. And if it's empty, I've got a lot of questions here. 
Um, yeah. though I, so I think like the evidence there that Jesus vindicated his claims to divinity by rising from the dead, uh, I, I would say that that, uh, that evidence was, was, was quite convincing to me. And I think it's important to share that, that evidence with others. Yes. Now, what were some of the bigger, maybe stumbling blocks, if any, of you coming into the Catholic church, like any red flags or anything that you were like, oh, this is really hard for me to grasp, maybe the Eucharist or I don't know. Yeah, what it was funny. The, you, blocks? the Eucharist, not really. John 6 was very clear to me. Yeah. And 1 Corinthians 11 and the idea of Jesus being the Passover lamb made perfect sense. The big stumbling blocks were more like Mary and the saints taking okay. away from Jesus. A big stumbling block were Catholics that I felt were kind of superstitious. And even today, I'm critical of that. Like, you'll see people who will have, like, a no, foolproof novena request always answered. Like, he's, God's not FedEx. He's not a genie. Not like right. you're going to get things answered by guarantee. That's superstition. I don't like that. The church doesn't like that. Um, but the idea of the saints and Mary at the beginning, I thought they had just pointed away from Jesus. Uh, it wasn't until later on in my conversion experience before being received into the church, I saw, no, this this makes sense. This, this makes sense that um, uh, Mary especially points to Christ. And if we just start the most fundamental Marian dogma, Theotokos, mother of God, the other dogmas flow from that, from her being the mother of God. We just have to take that seriously. And especially that the Protestant reformers didn't really have problems with these dogmas. Right. They, they, they held Mary in quite high esteem. They, they thought it was scandalous to say Mary was not ever virgin. And I think it's because modern, modern culture uh, treats like sexuality so differently. Even modern Protestants have bought into it. And so for me, even if I had these doubts, there's other things in modern Protestantism, I said, no, I, I can't buy into it. I can't buy into once saved, always saved. Not every Protestant believes that, but many do. Uh, you know, look, the Bible is very clear. You can lose your salvation. I had a whole debate about that with James White a few years ago. Um, uh, what, what else in, in modern Protestantism? Oh, the, the abandoning Jesus' teaching on divorce. I'm like, you guys are literalists, but Jesus says in Mark 10, whoever divorces a spouse and remarries another commits adultery. He's clear. Yeah. He's absolutely clear, clear on this. Um, and yet, many Protestant churches see divorce as, as, as acceptable. And I just don't see how you can do that when, unless you're just looking at this from the lens of the culture rather mm -hmm. than from the lens of scripture and the lens of sacred tradition. So um, there were, you know, so with Mary and the Marian dogmas, uh, trying to get over looking at the historical basis for these and trying to break away from a sola scriptura mentality that look, some things we believe as Catholics, they're, they're not explicit in scripture, but so what Protestants believe that there's no more public revelation. That's not explicit in scripture. Mormons believe they're living apostles. Protestants and Catholics do not. And Eastern Orthodox do not believe they're living apostles, but the Bible doesn't say that apostolic, the office of the apostles stopped. It doesn't say that, but tradition tells us it has. So, you know, and then, of course, there's the canon of scripture, which mm -hmm. is not in the Bible. So we all have sacred traditions. The question is, who can, where, where are you going to um, ground them? Yes. And when you, you received all three sacraments of initiation right at once, uh, that's yes. awesome. So how, what did that feel like? Like, did you feel different afterwards or how did your life change like right after? Was it a gradual change or? It's gradual. I mean, it, it's a big boost, adrenaline boost that night when you get them all. But then you're, you're slowly growing. I'm still growing uh, as a Christian. It's just like you're growing as a person. When you're a kid and you get bigger, you don't notice you're growing until you look at an old picture. That's C.S. Yeah. Lewis that has okay. said that. You know, I was like, you you're so you clever. Can't. That's really good. Yeah, right. No, I'm clever. <laughs> I'm, I'm clever when it comes to stealing from the greats. So um, yeah. imitation is the flattery, sincerest form. Yeah. Uh, no, you, you don't. Um, you, can't see, you can't see you're growing right at the moment. You have to look back. And so when I look back, I mean, when I was 16, I was a different Christian when I was 26, 10 years later, I'm a still very different Christian now at the age of 36, very different. Mostly I get, um, I, I, I hope I've become less of a screwball, mm. frankly. Like when you're 16, you're stupid. When you're 26, you're less stupid. And I think life is a journey, ideally becoming less stupid. If you become more <laughs> stupid in life, that is a grand failure on your part. That the goal, because here's the thing, when you're young, you get to, you know, when I was, when I was a kid, when I was 18, I would do 48 hour shifts at work. Like I would stay up all night with friends, 
go to a video job the next day for 12 hours. I could go 48 hours straight. I could eat anything I wanted and not feel bad. It was amazing. Now, if I have two slices of pepperoni pizza, I need Tums to get me to bed. You know, <laughs> so it's like your, your body starts failing you. But, this, but here's the thing. But when I was 16 and had an iron stomach and, and could stay up whenever I wanted and had all this energy and it's great and, you know, I was super thin and I didn't put on any extra weight anywhere. Though Laura says I was too skinny back then. And I probably was. Um, I was an idiot because wisdom is something you only get through, through time. So that's the benefit of getting older is you trade your youth for wisdom. That's how it's always been unless God supernaturally gives you wisdom, which is amazing. And, and I think he did give me some in college and other things like that because even when I was 26, I was doing pro-life missionary work. I was doing evangelism. And that's what helped me uh, to actually be hired full-time by Catholic Answers when I was 28. Uh, so, um, you know, but I, I still feel wiser now than when I was 26 and I'll feel the same way when I'm 46 and 56. And that's, that's just the journey. And I think I heard you say one time that, you know, when you got married, you know, marriage kind of tames a man, not tames a man, but it, it you know, civilizes, like puts, man. civilizes the man. That's right. It civilizes civilizes man. man. Because that's the thing. That's the other thing that's, that's difficult. I mean, I will hear my wife and I will talk with young Catholic women. And they always say, where are all the good Catholic men? And my answer is, they're married. And my wife will say the same thing. The good Catholic men are married. Because, uh, and, and Laura has been a great influence on me, and I've helped her. Marriage is a growing experience. And when you are married, you're for, and especially when you have children, you're forced to become responsible. Mm -hmm. And you have to put others' needs ahead of your own, and you have to mature. you got to grow up. And so it's a good thing. But men who don't do that, who live, and this happens to women too. If you live life on your schedule, on your time, doing everything you want to do whenever you want to do it, it's easy for your natural and good self-interest to become unnatural and bad selfishness. Mm -hmm. Self-interest is fine. You have to love yourself before you can love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. But when you put yourself ahead of your neighbor, then, you know, the, your wants ahead of their needs, then you got a problem. So marriage is a good thing. So for young Catholic women, it's hard. They, they you know, the Catholic men, they're not going to mass, or if they are going, they don't really take it seriously. And it's hard. They see the good Catholic men are either the priests, the seminarians, uh, the, the husbands, or the fiancés. So, you know, don't, you can't be talking to, now that you're, you're engaged now. Yeah. Didn't you say that early in the interview? Yes, yeah, yes, you're, yes. Yeah, so now people, now there's these women who will see, oh, wow, you're great at committing. I love you. So it's just, that's what's, um, that's what's strange about it. And that's, you know, that's something to, to be mindful for. But that's why we have to provide venues, I think, for young men who are unmarried to be mentored. And, I, and when I was growing up, when I was a young man, I had like Catholic dads or kind of my surrogate Catholic dads. And I looked up to them and they gave me an idea of what it means to be a Catholic man. And so yes. I think... We have to either, we have to seek out those mentors if we need it or um, become those mentors if we have it. Weren't you chasing tornadoes right before you got married? I thought I heard you say that one time. Yeah, but... I don't do that anymore. <laughs> now I'm not even allowed to go to the store if it's icy. You, know, wow. you can't die. You support three children. Wow, that's, why that's, I have, that's why I have life insurance though and my book royalties in perpetuity. But you, when you get married, yeah, it's, it's not about you anymore. Though that was, I remember though, when I was, when I was a young man, when I was unmarried, um, yeah, I would just, you know, you're riskier. Also, marriage civilizes men. When you're unmarried, ah, eh, whatever. If I die, it's my life. Yeah. But I can't take chances in my life anymore because I got kids, I got a family. So, I mean, um, uh, yeah, when I was, in my post-college days, I lived in Kansas working at a pro-life organization there. We would travel across the country. We were based in Wichita. Mm. And I remember I went out with a friend of mine. He, he ended up being the best man at my wedding. And we went chasing tornadoes. And we hooked up his computer to a phone as a mobile hotspot. And we had radar tracking. And so we were just driving around out in the boonies. at the front. We were at the front of this. When you do that, there's usually like eight or 10 cars all out at the same time trying to find them. And so we were at the front of it uh, going and chasing the tornadoes. And we saw one go down and it touched and then went right back up again. But that was it. Wow. But, uh, you know, the scariest thing was when we were driving home uh, through a, a shelf cloud. It was torrential rain. That was the scariest part. Not oh the my tornado. Goodness. The rain was. And we spun out on the road. We spun 360 degrees. 
and then wow. we and then we just kept going. <laughs> we were we high fived each other that we didn't die. But yeah, yeah. wow. We'll so okay, the, the, so the riskiest thing, the riskiest thing to my health that I do now is getting a double cheeseburger at McDonald's at eleven. Wow, that is the riskiest <laughs> thing I do with my health. Oh man. So okay, you know I'm about to get married, God willing, this year. And uh, so what advice do you have for, for someone like me? What's some marriage advice that you can give the Catholic men out there? Yeah, the, the advice I would give is don't trade your long-term marital happiness for some kind of short-term thing that you think will make you happy. Mm-hmm. Sometimes this is minor, like saying something mean to your wife because you think you can make a point that's trading law. And I, you know, hey, I'm not innocent. I do these things. I do that. Sometimes I wish I wouldn't. The more severe thing would be like, you know, adultery or emotional infidelity. Mm. Uh, You know, that's trading your long term marital happiness for something that will not make you happy. Uh, But I would say that you need to look at marriage as that this is a growing experience. You have to grow in this. Your wife is going to grow in this. If you are blessed with children, that will accelerate the growing process. You can't buy into our culture's mentality that if we're not compatible, the marriage isn't working. The marriage is working if you two are alive and are united to one another. Marriage is indissoluble. It's not, marriage is not about, marriage is not dating with a certificate. You can't think of it as, you can never entertain the idea if this doesn't work out. Mm-hmm. It is always going to work out. You will always be married uh, even if you end up living separated from one another or civilly divorced, unless the church annuls your marriage. But you should always operate operate with the mindset that your marriage is valid. The church always says that. Mm -hmm. So I would just say the advice is you have to look at it as this is do or die. You are not getting out of this. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to get out of this. This is someone to be able to to grow in holiness with, to grow in maturity with. So you have to cut each other slack about these Mm -hmm. things. And you have to be rooted in a spiritual life together, to pray together, to go to mass together. Form your identity as a couple and root that in solid formation spiritually with other good married friends. Uh, it, it's just like maintaining holiness when you're single, but now you have another person to help you and another person whose needs you have to be considerate of. Like one thing my wife and I fight about sometimes is I'll plan to do something. Heck, I might even, we might even get in a fight about this. I forgot to tell her I had an interview. <laughs> so the kids came in and she's like, you need to let me know the schedule. I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm distracted. I have a bad short-term memory. I, I I have a hard time remembering people's names, faces, grocery lists. I can remember Greek lexicons. I can remember uh, when I read books on theology and philosophy, I can see the pages in my mind. Wow. But I can't, but, but God won't let me have short term memory. I can't remember anything short term. I have to, yeah. I write everything down on my phone so I won't forget it. My name's Eric. So, Nice right. to, my name's Eric. Right. Nice to that, stuff, that stuff just absolutely slips my mind because I think God is like, Trent, I need you to remember all this other stuff for your job. Wow. And you're just not going to remember some of this other stuff, the, the short term. Yeah. And so, uh, and so, you know, I'll forget to tell my wife about the schedule and that, and that's mm-hmm. unfair to her because she needs to know the schedule to repair. Whereas when you're single, you don't have to tell anybody your schedule. Mm-hmm. My schedule. I don't tell people. I don't call, when I was 25, I didn't call my mom and say, here's what I'm going to do today. You just do what you want to do. You have yeah. total freedom. But in marriage, you give up freedom for something better. Mm. And so that's the mindset. Uh, so that's like my main tip. There's other things to consider. But I, I think it's important to get on the same page spiritually, emotionally, financially. Make sure that you guys have your spending figured out and that you're not driving yourself into a debt hole mm. uh, unnecessarily or really at all. Yeah. Um, the last one would be a fun one. Uh, wait, usually not always i'm actually gonna do a podcast on infertility next week but um usually you'll be blessed with children it's usually the case so because of that uh, your first year of marriage just eat out have fun eat out go out as much as you can yes because then when you have kids you don't go anywhere and you, unless you pay a babysitter or you twist the arm of a relative mm-hmm. to watch your kids um just go out what's funny with my wife and i we were talking about this she, she said, you know, we, we don't really fight. we oh, and for another advice for you, like advice for you as a married couple, man, mm-hmm. you and your wife, well, I don't know, we had a long distance engagement. This may not be the same for you, but I think a lot of couples fight a ton their first year of marriage. So just be prepared. You'll probably fight a lot because it's just brand new. 
Mm. It's new and clash. And that does, it doesn't mean you've made a mistake or something like that. Yeah. There's a way to fight fairly with people, to disagree fairly, to fight fairly. Uh, but now we say, yeah, we don't fight as much as when we were first married. We're like, why is that? I'm like, I think we're just too tired to fight. Mm. Like we have, we have the three kiddos. We've got everything going on. We, we realize things that we would have thought about in the first year of marriage. We cut each other slack now that we've been married for seven years. I think that continues the older you get, but um, yeah, cut each other slack and just, just enjoy that, that first year that you, that yeah. you have. So um, you never know what'll happen. Yeah. I recently met with a friend who said the first, well, before having kids, basically every day feels like your honeymoon almost. And then kids change everything, but it's a, it's a good change. Obviously it's a, a great change. You know, it's the You're supreme gift of marriage is children. So, but it's, it's a growth of love in your home. Yeah. The house is just filled with love when you have, when you have children and when you are mentally well and balanced, if your life is unhealthy, here's the thing. If your life is healthy, mm. children make the love grow. They make it b- better. Children never make anything worse. But I would say, here, I guess here's how I would put it. Uh, when your life is healthy, children add a lot of joy. When your life is unhealthy, children add a lot of stress. Mm. I'm still stressed by my kids. But if I have an unhealthy life financially, emotionally, spiritually, children will just exacerbate. It's not their fault. It's because I'm living an unhealthy life. Yeah. And so they, and so their presence is stressful. And that happens if I'm in a stressful point, the children stress me out. But if I'm good and balanced and on good terms with God and my work and friends and family, I have energy Mm -hmm. for them and I, they bring me joy. So it's about us get it. And so use that first time in your marriage, get your house in order before, especially if you're going to be blessed with children. Mm Mm-hmm. I think one of the coolest things we just met with a, a deacon from our church uh, yesterday, actually. And, yeah. um, and it was just so cool. He's like, Eric, your job is to get Katie to heaven. Katie, your job is to get Eric to heaven. And obviously we do this through Jesus Christ and like his grace, right, but like our vocation is to sharpen each other to become great saints. Right. And, uh, and I love that it is like the Catholic church views marriage as a vocation because when I was Protestant, I didn't have that lens. I didn't understand that this was like a calling. Yeah. When I, when I go to Protestant weddings, it's funny. They last about 10 minutes. Right. Like you go, I go to a private, I went to a Protestant wedding once and it was beautiful and they're always outdoors and uh, not always, but a lot of times they're outdoors. And it was like 10, they walk up and it's like the, the, the wife, sorry, the, the bride's dad is the pastor and he gives the the sermon and I pronounce you husband and wife. And I'm like, what happened? We're, we're done. Because normally we, we have weddings during nuptial masses. And yes. it's good. The church has a rule that you basically have to get married in church. Mm-hmm. The church, I used to work in the office of marriage in the Diocese of Phoenix. And people always said, can we get married outside of a church? And I said, for all practical purposes, no, you can't. Because the church recognized, wants people to understand this is not a celebration of adult love. It is you entering into a sacrament and forming a domestic church. Yes. And you have to understand what you're getting into and not trivialize it like our, our culture does with marriage. Uh, now, I say for practical purposes because there's a, the, the bishop can allow a dispensation, can, well, sorry, the, can allow the marriage to take place not according to the proper canonical form of being married in a church. Uh, exceptions can be made. Like, let's say you're marrying, you, you got a dispensation to marry a Muslim. And the Muslim family of the bride refuses to set foot in a Catholic church. They consider it blasphemous. Well, you got the dispensation to marry your Muslim bride, um, even though I really question the prudence of that in many cases. Uh, you know, send the hate mail, whatever. Uh, this, is, this is, no, sorry, this is advice yeah. for people who are discerning marriage. Yes. Here's the question you need to ask about your boyfriend or girlfriend. And by the way, isn't it nice having a fiance? Because uh, you can say, this is my fiance instead of, yes. this is my girlfriend. Yeah, exactly. I'm not a middle schooler school anymore. Together. This is my girlfriend. <laughs> my girlfriend, what are you, 14? Yeah, exactly. And it's hard. And then it's like, this is my fiance. Now I feel like a French nobleman. This is my fiance. We're wow. going to go out for second, you know. After going we ride our out, horses I'll, I'll together in the vineyard. <laughs> then we shall relax in the parlor with my fiance. <laughs> risk you eating crumpets and tea anywho but um so no this is the question you got to ask is with your boyfriend or girlfriend would i be comfortable with this person raising my children without me 
what I, what I want this person, if I die, would I want this person to raise my children? With Laura, the answer is an absolute yes. I know that they'll have, they'll still have a great shot yeah. at, at staying Catholic. But if my wife isn't Catholic, she might promise to take him to mass. But oh. if it's not important enough for her to be Catholic, why is it important enough for my kids to be Catholic? And for people listening, especially for women, this is especially the mm-hmm. case for fathers. If the father isn't Catholic, there's a high degree of probability the children will not be Catholic. What's crazy is that if the dad is Catholic and the mom is not, there's still a decent chance the kids will remain Catholic. So it's, it's a funny statistical thing that, is, that we've borne out over the years to see. And Pope Leo XIII writes, uh, just warns in his encyclical Arcanum something. I think it's uh, just called Arcanum. Arcanum. Um, he warns not to marry someone who's not Catholic. Uh, oh, it's our, I mean, sorry, Arcanum divine, my bad. But yeah. Yes. Yeah. He um, warns about intermarriage. Yeah, That's even with Protestants, he, because right. he, he he warns against it. It's not like it's like prohibited absolutely. It's just there's a warning because it what it does is it creates a religious yeah. relativism in the household. It's hard. And yeah. If, so if you, you center your whole life on the Eucharist, like Christ Himself in the Eucharist, then how how do you have a united front? It, it's just it just makes it very hard when your whole center of spirituality is different. Absolutely, absolutely. But. Well, with our remaining time, Trent, just wanted to, uh, and thank you so much for that. That was awesome. I really enjoyed that. Um, sure. Just wanted to hear from you as a, as a Catholic apologist, what are some of the toughest questions you've gotten? Or have you ever been stumped? Or like, I'm just curious for, yeah, like, is there any? Like, I don't know. It depends. Tough, tough like, sometimes I get questions about saints I don't know because I'm not a big saint guy. Mm. I did a whole hour once on the resurrection for Catholic Answers Live. And somebody said, what happened to the soldier who thrust the spear into Jesus? I said, I have no idea. Turns out his name is St. Longinus. There's a whole story about him. Okay. <laughs> but yeah. the things like, the like, toughest questions, I mean, some questions get really nitty gritty philosophically or scientifically, but the toughest ones are usually just this horrible thing happened to me or someone I love. Why did God let this happen? How do you answer that? Well, God let it happen because God is all powerful and can secure a greater good, no matter what evil exists. Okay. That's true, but it's not very satisfying. Yeah. So to, to empathize with people and to help them to understand that those are probably the toughest questions I get. And I always try to walk people through them. Mm. Um, you know, or, or tough questions like, well, I want to believe in God, but I, but I, God hasn't made himself clear to me. Why, why don't I believe? And there I might say, maybe you should just pretend to believe not to lie. But just if you're really on the fence, do kind of a Pascal's wager and say, all right, I'm just going to act like a Christian and I'm going to pray and pretend like God is there, even though I don't believe it. And then just see what happens. And sometimes it becomes second nature if you do it enough. Uh, we, we can will to believe certain things. Not, we just can't will to believe things that are obviously false. But if we're not sure, we can gradually move from 50-50 to being convinced of something. Yeah. Now, you did recently write a book, Can a Catholic Be Socialist? So yeah. I just am curious, like, what do you sense is coming for America? And what, what will it mean to be Catholic? We mentioned this earlier, just being countercultural. But like, what do you think is coming down the pike? And like, how do we respond as Catholics? Well, I am concerned there will be two kinds of Catholics. Mm-hmm. Those that are faithful to the culture and those that are faithful to the church. We have a Catholic president right now who believes abortion should be legal, who supports LGBT ideology. Many Catholic celebrities, Stephen Colbert, you know, they, they're supportive of these things. So people don't get mad at uh, Joe Biden for being a Catholic president because his values align with the culture. But they get mad at Amy Coney Barrett for being a Catholic Supreme Court justice because they're worried she's going to overturn Roe v. Wade. So I think we'll always have Catholicism, but we'll have kind of a, a uh, Catholics that are acceptable to the culture because they've compromised on morality and compromised on relativism. They, they're not going to say anybody's going to go to hell, things like that. Anybody can have the Eucharist, doesn't matter. And we're going to have Catholics who are faithful to the church and the Catholics who are faithful will lose, as Cardinal Ratzinger said a, while, a long time ago, they'll lose their social privileges. You know, they'll be ostracized. They may, people may not want them working at certain positions and there may even be discrimination, and that's something we will have to endure gracefully and still promote the gospel while we're doing that. Yeah, I mean, in <clears throat> Paul's letter to Timothy, one of them, I can't remember if it's first or second Timothy, he says, if you seek to live a godly life, you will be persecuted. Right. And um, yeah. 
I think that's a good thing though for Christians to like, Hey, like let's get tested here and see who can endure and who's going to fall away and like test right. the faith. Like God disciplines the sons he loves. Um, right. And so final thought here, uh, just, I know you also have another book either coming out or it's already out called Counter- counterfeit Christ. Well, I already have counterfeit Christ out. Yes. Okay. And is one of the counterfeit Christ like, like talking a little bit about the Protestant view of Jesus as well? Some Protestant views like that Jesus is health and wealth gospel. Some Protestants believe that, Hey, if you're faithful, then God will give you money. God will make sure you're always have, have enough money and health. Mm-hmm. But that's not true. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Yeah. Jesus is the most faithful person who ever lived, but he died on a cross without any possessions. All he died were the clothes on his back. Uh, the fact of the matter is that God is not, he blesses some people with riches and he blesses other people with enough and others uh, have poverty. And regardless of the situation, it doesn't mean you have to stay in poverty, but it just means God can allow us to have all different kinds of trials to grow closer to him. Mm. Uh, faithfulness is not measured in, by our by our bank accounts. So I talk about that and other and other Protestants that just try to denigrate the Eucharist and, and things mm-hmm. like that. And so that's all in that. Yeah, kind of for Christ. Yeah. So yeah, my final question would just be, what you know, if there's a Protestant out there who's really involved in his or her church and very happy with where they're at, like, why would you say like why ought this person to become Catholic? Well, what I would say to him is, what if you met a Jewish person? or a Muslim person, or an atheist who says, I'm totally happy. Why would I become Christian? You'd probably say to them, well, you would want salvation, right? Salvation comes to us, you would say through Christ, but, uh, and it does ultimately come through Christ, but we have to look at the Bible and look at tradition to say, how did Christ give salvation to us? He died on the cross, but the Bible is very clear that it's given to us through sacraments. It's given to us through baptism. First Peter 3.21, baptism now saves you. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. John 3.5, unless you are born of water and spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Baptism takes away our sins. It makes us saved. But how do we remain saved? The Bible is also clear you can lose your salvation. What has God given us to keep us in Christ, as Paul says? Well, he gave us a church to give us the sacraments, to give us the Eucharist, to give us the sacrament of reconciliation. Uh, that is what we see from the earliest days in the church's history. And so what I would say is just as you would tell a non-Christian, they should become Christian to experience salvation in Jesus. I would tell you, you should become Catholic to be in full communion with Christ's church. You're already in partial communion by being baptized. I just want, would want you to be in full communion to experience the fullness of salvation offered through Christ's church, uh, which is Christ gave that to us. He said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life within you. Now, some people who don't know they need the Eucharist or salvation will be judged differently than those who realize Christ gave us the Eucharist through the priesthood, but choose to forsake it anyways. And I would want you to be able to receive the, the fullness of that salvation. Wow, that's so good. All right, well, thank you so much, Trent. Lastly, where can people find you if they want to follow your work? Uh, I would recommend uh, my website, trenthorn.com. Uh, I also have my podcast, The Council of Trent, C-O-U-N-S-E-L. Uh, you yes. can become a premium subscriber to it at trenthornpodcast.com. Uh, you can also listen for free at iTunes and Google Play. All right. Thanks, Trent. God bless. No problem.